Um, hi everyone. Um, I know that we, at least to we Eclipse had a fancy lunch now, so uh, we need an extra interesting panel discussion so that we don't all fall asleep. Um, I hope that we can deliver. Um, uh, the panel is uh, supposed to be an inter interactive session with the audience. We are the audience, but everyone else, both in the room and via Zoom, is also the audience. So if you want to be interactive, just uh, let us know and we can also give, give you the floor. But uh, in order to have a more structured um, panel, we've invited four, four colleagues. Uh, we already know from uh, previous collaboration and we know that they have interesting things to share. Um, so we'll invite uh, people to um, share their experience. Uh, we would like us to uh, discuss um, experience with integrating research-based teaching, research infrastructures, as well as industry-based workflows uh, in the curricula. We'd like to learn about the uh, experience, the problems, the solutions you've come up with, and uh, tips for other people to do this in a successful manner. Uh, so I'll be asking a few very general questions and then I'll be calling on each of you to share your opinions. Um, after each round we can also, if you agree, open the floor to input from, from the rest of the audience. Um, uh, Juliana, could you please alert me if we have any messages in chat because I won't be able to yes. check everything. Okay, uh, so um, if you think about your previous uh, experience in um, trying to integrate uh, research-based teaching or research infrastructures or industry-based workflows into your teaching, um, what challenges have you had uh, and what the challenges have your students had uh, with uh, such approaches? Mieta, could you maybe start? Um, okay. <laughs> Now, uh, my, my experience is, is from, uh, I uh, regularly teach a few uh, online courses and uh, two of them are mainly for BA students, so, so they are sort of introductory. So one is uh, about corpus linguistics and one is about speech analysis. And uh, then I have a course called Data Clinic, which is for master students and PhD students who are uh, working on their thesis. And in addition to this, I, I'm also sometimes called to have, um, well, visiting lectures or, or tutorials uh, in some research groups. And, um, well, I think um, the good thing about having this uh, sort of infrastructures is that, that, that there are tools that you can rely on. Uh, like, for example, for the uh, corpus linguistics course, uh, we uh, we like to use uh, a corp system, which has a lot of corpora available, and there's a one uh, common system for accessing those, and and we know how to uh, link to them and how to cite them, and we know their uh, contents pretty well, or at least we we can find out about it, uh, and uh, uh, for the Prod course, the speech analysis course, yeah, we have the Prod uh, program that's, that's also used heavily. Um, the problems arise, uh, arise when, um, well, if there's some technical glitches, for example, if CORP is under very heavy uh, load and then uh, we are trying to have a course and then the students are trying to make their assignments and searches and then the system doesn't work, well, um, uh, that's uh, one thing, so uh, how to manage that kind of situations if, if the system is not working. Or, um, and, uh, uh, another thing that's, uh, that comes up regularly is that um, the learning content needs to be versioned um, and uh, you need to make some modifications and changes every year and uh, when the materials or tools change, then you, then you ha have to be able to uh, follow up with those. Um, so I guess uh, those are the main sources for problems. We have been able to cope with them so far, but uh, let's hope that 
this thing still in place. Vincent? Yes, um, I teach a uh, course on using flattering tools in uh, computational lexicography in the master's in linguistics, just to give you a bit of context. And um, I think that works pretty well. So students have to uh, take a text file from somewhere, send it to an automatic tagger from the Clarence switchboard, take the output, upload it into an online corpus search engine, uh, auto search engine, and uh, do some uh, concordances. Just to, uh, but that, so that works fine if tools work, of course. If uh, just, just like you said, if you have, I don't have a lot of students, so if you have a lot of students and they all press process at the same time, then uh, then you notice um, servers falling over. Um, but I also notice a, it's a very different uh, level of basic computer literacy. In uh, students, I mean, they're, they're digital natives, but they don't know what the directory structure is mm -hmm. sometimes. Some people do, but some people don't, because on a phone you don't need a directory structure. <laughs> um, so then you need to start explaining things which have nothing to do with your course. And uh, um, I noticed that also in another course I teach, which is uh, machine translation to, to translators. Uh, and um, people. People, just like was said uh, before, you you have to take a lot of um, steps back, which have nothing to do with your specific course, but which are general research uh, things that you expect people to know in a master's program or in an advanced master's program. But apparently, people are not so familiar with that, and then you have to explain that you have a hypothesis and. Uh, independent variables or uh, things like that. And yeah, so so I think that's my main challenge is before you get to what you actually want to teach, you've lost quite a lot of time. Not for all students, of course, but uh, the in, in, incoming stream of students is so diverse sometimes uh, what they know. So, so I think that's the difficulty to, to work with these. You have quick students and you have slow students and um, some of them need so many extra uh, attention, um, yeah. So it takes sometimes quite some time. Or well, you have to devote all your attention to one student, and, and the others are have to, have to work on their own. Uh, that's that's mainly my uh, experience. Uh, if we if we go back to, to uh, working with the industry, um, I think in in our. Um, the past master program in speech and language technology, we have a very uh, common way of working with industry. There are internships in, uh, in industry, and mainly this is based on a network of students who studied this uh, master before, and they went to industry, and, and so they know what the master is about, and they know what is expected from the internship, and that works pretty pretty good, I think. Um, if you have connections with industry for, for people that do not know the program, then I think it's it's uh, yeah. Then they they might not be researchers, so they might not know what research is about, or or they, they want somebody indeed to just annotate the purpose, which is not really interesting if you're an AI student. Uh, so sometimes it's difficult to to, to delineate a, a three month internship or. or thesis program that's doable and that's a full experiment from start to end with evaluation and uh, yeah, yeah so that's uh, but I think mainly it works well because we can rely on the students that went to industry and they know uh, what courses are like. that's that would be my advice keep track of your students uh, in industry and, uh, that's in alumni relationships mm -hmm. I think that's a brilliant tip, actually. Okay, uh, if we now uh, move on to the um, panelists uh, joining us virtually, Vesna, could you please share uh, your challenges for you and for your students when you try to integrate either research-based teaching, research infrastructures, or in 
industry-based. May I suggest maybe, maybe you could close the uh, uh, PowerPoint and, and uh, show their faces so we can see who is talking. The audience asked if you could stop the screen sharing. Yeah. Like this? Yes. So we can know who's talking. Vesna. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Invitation. Um, so let me maybe first uh, set the scene. Um, so my experience with the integration of the Claren infrastructure is especially focused on language resources um, in the uh, Claren resource families as well as Claren virtual language observatory. And um, I have been implementing this in particular in our MA program translation at the University of Vienna. So our main challenge is already that we have a very diverse um, offerings. Our students can choose from 14 languages in combination with German. But on the other hand, this is from my perspective, uh, the benefit of Clarin, that Clarin does offer this diversity. Uh, I've been implementing um, Clarin infra, um, infrastructure in the courses on project management, quality management, uh, terminology and language resource management. And our student sizes are approximately from 30 to 60 students. So we are talking really about um, large numbers of students. And this brings me already to challenges that already have been covered today. These are vastly different levels in computer literacy with 60 students. This is a given, um, but on the other hand, um, it allows you to also integrate, you know, students that have prior experience, such uh, as people who already worked in industry, industry and so on. So, you know, pros and cons as always in such um, diversity. Um, I would say that computer literacy is the biggest obstacle, actually, um, and toning down one own, uh, one own uh, expectations, what can be done. So I would say the integration of infrastructures into teaching should be seen more um, as the journey is the goal and not, you know, to get there in one uh, go. Um, so, yeah, so these are my, my first thoughts on the topic. Petya? Yeah, hi, I didn't hear, sorry. Um, so I just uh, quickly would like to share my experience with uh, two types of uh, teaching, research-based teaching in uh, bachelor level. So in my case, I teach students in philology. This means that we have a severe competition from literature studies. They get the best students. I mean, before we go to industry, we already have some competition inside. And um, what I do uh, with uh, bachelors in class, it is to, um, to turn all the small uh, grammar uh, topics that we uh, have to pass into research questions. For example, um, for example, we have abstract nouns and um, I go step by step like uh, first, okay, go to the net, Google or whatever you want and, and find some examples whether this abstract noun has also plural form contrary to what we assume that it doesn't have. And then when they have something back, I can uh, tell them, uh, okay, but cannot make any statistics, you cannot make any generalizations by this. You need some concordancer, and I introduced them this, and it is uh, very well received, actually, because they can um, uh, see different word forms in morphological, um, morphologically uh, rich language like Bulgarian, and also um, find more examples, of course, and classify them. Um, the... Uh, the other one is uh, a small internship at our uh, CLADA infrastructure uh, and the, the task was with bachelor students again uh, to uh, add semantic roles to a valency dictionary of Bulgarian and also they had to transfer some knowledge from English to Bulgarian because we used WordNet. We don't have such an extensive uh, study in Bulgarian. 
and the problems. The problems with uh, the first kind of teaching is that usually students go to the dictionary, they get the definitions of the words and they get back to me. They uh, need some time to, uh, to know that you need some uh, evidence in order to make them generalizations and it takes time. Uh, and then the other case, um, the internship, uh, it was uh, difficult uh, to understand, for them to understand uh, how to transfer knowledge from another language to Bulgarian, um, how to make the connection between several resources like WordNet, WorkNet, uh, Valency Lexicon, uh, how to apply linguistic tests because taking any uh, big decisions about this and how to be consistent not to take one decision in this case and then another in another case. Uh, also to handle similar meanings, uh, which exactly is the verb that translates uh, in English from Bulgarian or vice versa. So uh, generally these were the problems that I encountered in my teaching. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I think we have very, a very diverse set of courses and what you're trying to use and do with the students and uh, equally diverse uh, obstacles or issues that you have encountered. Um, would anyone uh, from the rest of the audience have something uh, interesting to share that is maybe important for us to be aware of but has not been mentioned by the four panelists? Uh, people on Zoom just shout out because I can see all of you. But if we have any volunteers in the room, would you have any obstacles that you have encountered? Yes, Marco? Obviously, uh, oh, so can, exactly. Can, can people online hear me? Maybe not. Yes, yes they can. Yes. <laughs> so basically, I, I, it's more adding to, to the experiences that the college has shared. So, uh, Basically, uh, for instance, the dilemma where you end up teaching something that is not the topic of your course because you, you figure out that there is a gap in the knowledge of the students that is purely technical and you have to teach them something that sounds like general computer literacy. I've encountered exactly the same problem teaching a, a course in, uh, in not such as the guest, guest course. So you're you know, being invited with a topic and you're really supposed to be about that topic. And you end up, and, and it was about extracting data from a corpus and then putting them in a table and, and ending up with this physical analysis. And I, I created the whole pipeline and it was all perfect and then I figured out that the students don't know how to use these basic regular expressions and, and Excel tables and stuff like that. So they were now basically teaching them. And I had kind of the same crisis, I think, as, as you had where you were like, okay, my courses, the topic of my courses would need to change because I'm this uh, teaching, I'm spending 30% of the time, you know, teaching them how to add two numbers. But uh, I figured out that actually they did not have any problem with this. For them, from their perspective, this is not a problem. This is, this is an inherent part of what, I have to, of what I have to teach them. So as long as I take them somewhere where they went previously on the level of the content of the course, they are happy. So basically, it might be partially also a problem that we kind of create for ourselves because we didn't know what our expectations were at the beginning and how little time we were planning to spend on these things that we consider you know, peripheral. But in the end, as far as I can tell from the, from the evaluation, no one has said you know, uh, too much time spent on things that are not topics. That was kind of a, 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 a well, could have been you know, just that uh, I was lucky with the, the group and they were, they were happy with the course, but uh, no problem about that at all. But I was expecting that to be a major thing in the evaluation. Thanks a lot. Anyone else? Maybe via Zoom? Um, I can share an obstacle of my own. Whenever I embark on anything related to or remotely looking like research-based teaching, um, I end up being a lot, more, um, under, a lot more under stress than with any other regular type of teaching because the, um, the problems that the students will encounter is totally unpredictable. The only thing that I can predict is that it's going to be like the Wild West, right? 
So you don't, you can't prepare in advance to help them out quickly or efficiently because it's endless what they will get stuck with. So you end up having to drop things uh, that are unrelated to this course, but you still have to do because you need to help them out in order for the course to be successful. I personally find this very stressful, especially when I have a high teaching load in the same semester. So not every course can be done brilliantly or perfectly. You just need to somehow get through the semester. Um, yeah, I, I find this a little bit problematic. You cannot control or plan uh, really well or really well. Okay, if there's no input at this point from uh, participants via Zoom, maybe we can move on to the next question. And at any point, if you have anything popping up, just let us know. Um, the second question is that given your current uh, experience, especially with the obstacles, what would you now do differently for the next semester? Still trying to keep everything that you found uh, positive and beneficial from this side of teaching, but avoiding the stress and the problems both for you and for your students. What, what, what do you think, what are the tips or the solutions to the problems that you have encountered? Mieta. Uh, I think, well, <laughs> you already mentioned it, the teacher's workload is an issue. And, uh, all of us have other duties as well as teaching and and it's hard work and um, um, I'm personally struggling with a bad conscience of not being able to support the students as much as I should. So um, what I would do differently is not to agree uh, to give the courses uh, always alone or uh, and uh, I would really like to have uh, somebody um, to teach them with and it, it's been very helpful i have been uh, giving uh, the corpus linguistics course for example with a colleague and we can share the tasks and the assessment duties and and things like that that, that tend to take a lot of time and be very stressful and they always come at the same time and the same moments when every all the other workload uh, appears so so I would encourage uh, teachers to find a colleague who can, who, who, with whom they can uh, work uh, well. And not to, uh, well, um, at some point we were allowed to have student assistants uh, for the courses, uh, but I think it was a mistake. For students it was good uh, practice, but for at least for my courses it was a mistake because it was new students every year and it took me a lot of time to um, well teach them how to help me and um, it took a lot of time to do yes even more work so I dropped them I, I think you can't do it so better to have a professional colleague who knows the stuff yeah so more more teachers, that's Can, my answer, yes. <laughs> okay, Vincent? Yeah, um, I think, as suggested by uh, um, is that maybe uh, be, less, be less ambitious about what you want to teach the students and not uh, <clears throat> want to teach them how to do perfect research in, in one uh, for ECTS point course. Um, and um, so that, that's one thing, and maybe, uh, yeah, when I start teaching machine translation, I begin with the history, and, and maybe I should skip all that and go straight to uh, to the state of the art, so we can immediately stop working on that. Uh, and something which came to my attention uh, only yesterday um, is take a look at what the other courses are in the program and, and make sure that if there is a, a uh, an illogical order somewhere that you can try to rectify it so they get the Python course before you actually need them to use Python instead of after it because I think there is nobody apart from the teachers themselves that take care of this ordering yeah, maybe sometimes the students know this as well uh, but it depends so 
So to make sure that, that you're involved in the whole pro program, which is not more work probably, but uh, at least that you can suggest changes in the program. So um, that things that should come first in the, in the logical sense, in the learning curve, are, are taught first. Both very valuable uh, suggestions. Um, Vesna? Um, yeah, I would like to add that um, my recommendation would be to um, center on the learner-centered approach and not so much, you know, the teacher uh, as the oracle of all uh, students' problems and answers. So I'm a big fan of uh, peer review um, and peer, um, you know, um, project-based um, evaluation um, because, um, interestingly, um, they often come up with great solutions um, if they are really forced to do so, if they do not have the teacher to run to. Um, in our case, this often is the case because with 60 students and one uh, teacher, um, it's simply not possible. Um, so I would recommend really, um, you know, um, using the infrastructure, the language resources as best practice examples where students can um, look into, I don't know, best examples, how to provide metadata, um, I am using it a lot for, for example, standards. Um, I don't know uh, what is a TBX standard and so on, so that they have good examples also in their own language combinations. As I mentioned, we have 14. Um, and it's not all on me uh, to discover this, but I am providing, so to say, what Hoadley is calling scaffolding, a structure with opportunities for discovery. You know, you give them a safe space and they can explore. Um, I know this is not really in line with the Bologna and ECTS uh, points necessarily, but I think it allows a better growth in terms of learning experience. Thanks a lot. Uh, Petya? Yeah, I think that um, most of the points uh, that are re relevant here were already mentioned. Uh, so I can start with something that I like doing, and I think it's also a good uh, approach. Uh, something uh, when I give uh, the students to read something and uh, we have some hypotheses how the phenomenon is, then um, I introduce the opposite one or some alternative one, and then I ask them to uh, find evidence evidence and uh, to some, some, uh, somehow to uh, prove that mine is not so, you know, universal or so um, um, the, the right one in the world. There are many models that can be applied. So uh, I think especially for MA level, it is very good because they just start thinking about how to, and to, in order to have evidence, they have to read a lot and to think a lot and to apply some tests a lot. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to add this. Um, otherwise, um, I also like me at the, uh, think that I should be able to, to have more time for students because they need that. And at the same time, I don't have it. Um, and then, uh, of course, I agree that we can resign with the uh, best examples. Please consult this and that because uh, you can see how it is done. I don't have the time now. Um, and my advice would be um, for the course to be developed step by step, to start with something uh, that they are familiar with, uh, even if it's very naive for us in the beginning, and then incrementally to introduce them to more complex tasks or ways of uh, addressing these tasks. Yeah, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Do we have any comments or suggestions from the audience, either here in Utrecht or via Zoom? There have been some comments in the chat. Yes, Can, could you maybe read them? Um, yes. So there were a couple of suggestions on, on what to do with the students. There is one suggestion to have them find solutions themselves. So basically make them resourceful and research ways how to troubleshoot all these kinds of problems. Uh, then there were uh, questions whether ICT courses could be mandatory at the start of the academic year, and then there are practices in some to do that. And then uh, finally, a comment from Maya, and she also 
as students to discuss each other's research projects, and then that works quite well. Very valuable, yes. Um, what I'll try to do next time is that in addition to my workload, uh, I also sense that students have a pretty high workload as well, because for each course, each uh, lecturer just sees that course, and we apparently all make them do seminars. Um, so maybe to save on their energy and time, we could uh, interact and combine assignments with, uh, across several courses. If there's a, like an overview course, then maybe they could do a literature uh, review there, or if it's a methodology course, they could, could learn the methodology and then apply it in my practical course uh, on an experiment. So we could combine courses, and in terms of uh, ICT skills, I have seen uh, pretty successful approaches where two courses at two different faculties were combined, one from humanities, the other one from computer science, and you could have tandems of students so that the more technically skilled uh, part of the tandem can help out the humanities uh, uh, partner uh, instead of you having to interact with each student and teach them that. I can see that Dragos is making a comment. Yes, please. Uh, can I ask for the parents experience to be encouraging other colleagues to implement new tech, uh, technology and resources? It's been mentioned as the ideal situation. What's your experience? Um, well, uh, uh, my experience is that we've uh, did, did a little tour of all the universities in Flanders telling uh, whoever was willing to come to this session, but many PhD students had some professors to tell them about uh, the clarity infrastructure and how they could use it. But whether they actually use it, that's that's another thing I, I don't know. So I, I haven't followed up on, on whether they actually, uh, whether, what the effect was of this thing. And we probably should do it again every, every few years. Um, because climate change and the people change as well. Um, but maybe next time we should try to follow up, um, have to keep track of who was there and, and, and get some, uh, some feedback from these people, not only immediate feedback or about what you like about the seminar, but uh, after a year, go back to them and do you remember anything or uh, do you use anything of what we uh, so. Uh, in fact, in finally, that we have talked a lot about the uh, lack of um, digital skills or the low level of digital skills that the students have, but we should also remember that teachers themselves, they also need to be trained to use these tools in class. And uh, this has been clearly shown by some of the surveys that we have run in upstairs of lecturers in language programs, um, and in training, uh, doing the regular tools in languages. Uh, and that's quite a uh, time investment. So maybe the client is, can also organize some of those teachers who really hands on uh, showing them how to work with new technologies and then implement the classroom. Yes, uh, Vesna and Petya, would you have anything to add? Um, I'm from the same institution for, as uh, Dragor, so maybe I cannot really contribute something new for him. <laughs> um, yeah, my my experience is uh, by example. For example, if you uh, if you publish a paper and make some survey that is interesting, and then uh, the colleagues. Uh, uh, start to ask, and you present it, of course, they start to ask, hmm, uh, very nice research, what did you use? And I can say, okay, I use the Parliament data, uh, the concordancer, and it is very easy. And they say, hmm, you should uh, show me how to use it because I want to work on metaphors or something else as well. And uh, it, it works uh, pretty well in, in our case. It's really nice. I think it helps a lot if we have some ambassadors uh, at universities, right, who can, who can argue for this. And also, I think that they need to be willing to help out their colleagues with basic questions. 
Um, thanks. This uh, leads us to the last question uh, that I would like us to uh, consider at this panel. Um, you've been uh, shown, presented and sent the uh, guidelines that uh, we have developed in the Upskills project. Uh, in your opinion, how could these guidelines be further improved so that you can, uh, they, you can benefit from them even more and easily integrate this type of uh, teaching approach in your own work? Maybe again we can start with it. Yes. Well, I confess I didn't read through the entire guidelines. It was 150 pages or something. Uh, but I did take a look and I, I think there's a lot of valuable information. And uh, the one that I, I'm a, I'm a fan of. Uh, templates that uh, speak for themselves. I mean, I don't really think that, that teachers will actually read these guidelines ever. <laughs> uh, they might read the main part or, or skim through, um, but it would be really good to have some sort of, uh, uh, well, maybe, maybe publish a template for the ideal uh, research-based course and uh, maybe uh, because now there are a lot of implementations of these kinds of courses maybe there could be something like clickable things so you could click uh, on each of the sections and, and see what's uh, behind that and there might be links to uh, the implemented courses maybe example questions example assignments different uh, types of uh, areas where this could be applied so I don't know really, really how to do this, but um, it would be nice to uh, really use this template and also for assessment, uh, the assessment criteria for, for this kind of courses. So uh, I think that would be um, really usable if, if you could select the items that uh, match your own idea of a course and then you would get a checklist for yourself and you could start working on the course download materials from links if there's something general that you can already use. Um, like, I would like to have the, the video explaining what scientific citation is and how to cite it. <laughs> because that, that's my favorite. <laughs> 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 So you want you want a modular approach so that yes. every teacher yes. can select their own course, right? Yeah, that, that would be like a, a model for research-based teaching, and that could be applied in any way the teacher likes. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I must also admit that I didn't have time to read uh, surely not all of it. Uh, one entirely. Um, and that's exactly one of the, the issues that you mentioned. There, there, it's, it's very interesting, but it's too lengthy to be usable by people that already have a word overload, I think. And um, I may take a look at uh, Louise, uh, I think that's closely related, close, closest related to what I'm, uh, I'm teaching. And it seemed useful, but then there are things to Google Docs, and then uh, I don't know where, where it starts and where it ends, you know? It's, it's, like, it's like a mini internet. <laughs> it keeps on. I didn't know, where, was I still in, in the thing of, that you wrote for about skills, or was I outside in, in a while somewhere? Um, what I liked, uh, what I did before, uh, I use these uh, showcases, uh, the clearing showcases, and I uh, turn them into a slideshow and, and everything, and make sure everything works. And then I taught that to students. Uh, but that was to demonstrate clearing. I was teaching about clearing, not I was uh, teaching linguistics, or I was teaching about linguistics. <coughs> and then to showcase clearing, I took uh, took one of the, the showcases um, and went through it in detail to show them, okay, I click here and this happens. And, uh, and, uh, so that, that was my solution then, but that was very general. That was
or a specific goal on a certain linguistic topic, or is there enough to, work to, to show them the power of infrastructure? So if I understand correctly, you'd, you'd prefer some more self-contained, digestible units? Yeah, I think uh, our idea is a very good idea that um, something uh, which is not too texty to read through, but is more like checklist bullets, uh, yeah, hints and, and, and tips, um, yeah, not not to text it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Vesna? Um, yeah, I, I must concur. Uh, I do not want to sound as our students, but it is a lot of reading. Um, no, what what I would really uh, support is the idea of the modularity, because I think that many of us have the problem that we have a set curriculum. So it may be a problem that we take, you know, a completely... Um, made course as it is, it would be better to have a more digestible assignments with uh, smaller learning objectives that we could then um, implement in the courses that exist in our curriculum or parts of a situated learning experience or something similar. Because now it is a whole course that Unfortunately, I cannot take it because I'm obliged legally to teach what is in my curriculum. Thanks, Petya. Yeah. Okay. So I uh, I uh, had a look at this, um, and uh, my my uh, I feel like the following. I like very much the stories and testimonies. And I think there could be more of these, and even they could, uh, uh, yeah, incrementally uh, become more and more, and to be structured when um, when you teach a different kind of course, different audience, you could just go there, read some stories, and inspire yourself because you uh, become more confident about it, and you can just choose what you want there, right? Um, that's one thing. Then. It would be nice to have also testimonies from students. I mean, let's have also their perspective uh, when they take this course. And then um, maybe um, this one, uh, this um, guide uh, then would be complete because it could have both uh, points of view. Uh, I would also be uh, very grateful it, uh, if I could adapt, I mean, if you can easily adapt different uh, uh, nice ideas from there and incorporate in your course, as it was said already by Vesna uh, before me. And uh, uh, the last thing that I would like to say, and I'm very, very serious, uh, when I uh, went through this, I, I thought, okay, apart from being just guide, right? It's very boring to be a guide. It could be a book like how to teach better, how to teach, I mean, like in the series of books, how to live better, how to make money, how to become, I don't know what. Um, it, it has this um, specifics of giving very nice ideas. Uh, you don't need to take... Uh, on all the time ready things and implement you can also get some ideas and some inspiration and the more stories come there the better this future book would become yeah thank you do we have any comments and suggestions from the audience uh, for example i see people with a lot of uh, experience with both teaching uh, and with clarin you get to do Yes, maybe it can be only one team or several uh, things uh, within the course, and then you may uh, update the course outlines a little, 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 which is allowed. I think well, at Ottawa University, you can update your course outline uh, uh, 20 percent without any further legal changes or so at the very beginning. And I think that uh, uh, in one of the presentations, Marco, I think, mentioned the benefits of. of uh, uh, I'll be uh, learning that, that uh, about adaptation, usability, and, and uh, uh, finding the job for the students. So I think then if you modify the outline, then the initial classes, uh, they are of crucial importance because the students at the very, very start, at the very beginning, they have to be clearly instructed on why they are going to be taught this particular approach. Because, well, 
we like the traditional ones, why I should be bothered with, with something new, uh, what will be the benefits, and, and let's see, when I they also uh, uh, attempt to, to introduce my research into classes, um, some of them say, well, I'm not going to pursue academic career, I'm a B student, why should we be interested in hypothesis, you know, and then theory, and, and what's, what's in it of me? So, so we need somehow to also convince them that the benefits are beyond the, the academic career, and, and um, well, some, some, some way to keep them motivated. And, and then I think this will be part of the success then. Um, so that, that was what was going on in my mind, at least in this way. I'm not sure if anything was heard or what it you want maybe, to say something? Yes. yes. Maybe I can immediately respond to that because I was just talking to Frida Sturz before about uh, teaching research methods in applied linguistics where we are, where almost by definition a lot of the students are not really interested in the more <laughs> research part and more in applied uh, degrees. Also they go on to the main translation and interpreting. Not all of them I think you have to be interested in that research part, but then you can make a difference between more uh, fundamental research questions, but also very applied in a sense, for instance, of terminolo terminological, just describing their uh, search for the right terminology and combining that with a theoretical framework, but still focusing on a very applied yes. research question, because I don't think that it's necessary for all students in the degree of applied linguistics, for instance, it's okay if they don't all want to become researchers and if that is not their main focus, I think. It is a very applied degree. Um, so to really find that balance between, on the one hand, it's still an academic degree, so we do need to teach the basics there, but then also, I don't know, find the balance with the practice that it's not maybe necessary for all of them and that it's definitely not all of their interests. And, and then also continuing this idea, I was thinking that we have also to think of these synergies of approaches. Maybe within the same course, we can uh, use even more approaches, let's say, combine this uh, research based learning with project based learning, where, where they take this real life situation and, and, and try to solve them, also apply research in it. So it's a synergy, and, and there's no one simple answer to this. And, and that's why we need these workshops like this in discussions. Thank you. Yes? Uh, well, given, given these comments, and also your stress that you were uh, talking about half an hour ago, would it make sense to, uh, to, to talk about uh, given specific, given the diversity of specific situations, how to implement RBT as a sort of uh, 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 roadmap? As a sort of roadmap, what to do first? If if it is very hard to implement, what can we do first? What are the first elements to be taken into account? And then at the end of that spectrum, you have. The, the full, full, the full blown RBT, but that is maybe only possible in, uh, in li limited, very academic cases. Uh, maybe there is a sort of scale, uh, upscaling and downscaling possible in order to uh, address RBT as much as possible, as we cannot go for the full blown RBT in all situations. I very much agree with this modular approach that could maybe solve all our separate or related uh, issues in a in a very very efficient way. So the the goal is uh, to take them someplace. It's not uh, to reach uh, a designated uh, spot, right? Um, and if we do this at various courses or at various levels, then maybe they can combine it on their own or to the level that they will find useful for their own needs. Um, I'd also like to thank you for all your feedback on the guidelines, which is not limited to only this workshop, so keep sending the feedback if you have any at any later point. Um, and with this, uh, we, I'd like to close this session. Thanks a lot for the panelists who have prepared in advance, but also to any uh, spontaneous input that we have received. Thanks a lot.